Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 36. Our themes today will be pandemic math, our weakest links in the path forward on testing. So uh, uh, you want to know what I look at every morning. The first thing I look at is the COVID Act Now site. I think it uh, is reasonably up to date. Uh, pretty easy to figure out and it's a way to just kind of get a sense of how is the United States doing right now. Essentially, if you're yellow or green, you're doing pretty well. If you're orange, you're not doing really well. And if you're red, you're doing horrible, essentially. So so the states that we should be looking to say who's doing it well are all essentially the yellow states. Uh, orange, we're Nebraska, unfortunately, kind of middle of the pack. Then I click on Nebraska see what's going on in Nebraska. Nebraska results vary as well. Um, some rural counties really haven't had many cases, so their, their uh, rural isolation helps them in this state. Um, you'll see that uh, Lincoln, Grand Island, Hastings are doing pretty well here in the middle, but then you got sort of an arc of uh, folks uh, out west, uh, up north, uh, along the M M Missouri River, who are not doing so well. Uh, as I talk to physicians and people I know in these communities, the main thing is uh, weddings, uh, graduation parties, plays, golf scrambles, almost every red county County, that's what started it all. So it's the social stuff that's throwing everything off. And that's what you're seeing is the results vary. So I then go and look at our Tableau site and say, okay, what's going on at the county level? Mix and match a few things. And of course you have a, you know, three different examples here in Lancaster County. So Lincoln, Nebraska is in Lancaster County, not Lincoln County. Um, so if you look at Lincoln, Grand Island, Hastings, they're all down in here in this yellow range as far as uh, this uh, level of thresholds, uh, doing a pretty good job getting their, their epidemics under control. Douglas County is still smoldering. They did pass the mask mandate last week. However, it takes about two to three weeks uh, for that infection cycle to start showing the effect of that. So hopefully we'll see in the next two weeks that Douglas County numbers will stop start dropping. Uh, and then you have your outbreak counties like Lincoln, Nemaha, Burt, Buffalo, uh, mostly related to social events, uh, causing those numbers to go, uh, unfortunately, out a lot of control right now. Um, another thing, some of you may saw this uh, Fox News interview with uh, uh, Wallace and Trump. Uh, it was a little hard to watch, partly because both of them were wrong when they were arguing about who was doing the best, because we were both using the wrong numbers to measure who was best. And so they were both using case fatality rate, which is not what you would look at. So uh, case fatality rate is, the, is, a, is essentially just dividing the number of cases by the number of deaths, but the problem is both of these are likely wrong. So cases, if you look at the countries that had uh, case fatality rates above 10%, the problem in these countries is their outbreaks hit and they didn't have any testing capacity anywhere close to what they needed. And so these numbers are way undercounted, and so it makes their numbers off a little bit. So you can't use this because these counties, these countries aren't that bad, it's just because they didn't have enough testing. So the fatality rate is thrown off. On the other opposite end, you have India. It looks like India is doing well, but that's just because a lot of these people haven't died yet. Uh, their outbreak just happened in the last month, and it takes about a month. Uh, even and even documenting death by death certificate can take four to six weeks. So your deaths are lagging by four to six weeks in a big outbreak country like India. So there's a good chance India's fatalities could actually eclipse us all because they're just a really big country. So you wouldn't use case fatality to say who's doing best. What you should really look at is overall fatality rate. Uh, this would have been a better number for the interview to use. And so the United States at, at 52 per 100,000 is pretty close to you know, the middle of the, well, it's, it's, actually this is mostly all the worst countries. So uh, we aren't doing very well at all. Uh, we had a couple countries, you know, uh, Spain and Italy got hit really fast and so they weren't prepared, but they have since gotten their outbreaks under control. Uh, interestingly, the United Kingdom initially tried herd immunity until they ran the numbers and realized, oh crap, we can't go there. So I'll talk a little about that. If you want to say who's doing a good job, I would look at both Germany and Japan. These are developed countries. There are peers economically. Uh, our technology and resources should equal theirs. Uh, if we had done as well as Germany, uh, our fate, our, we'd only have 36 fatali thousand fatalities instead of 170,000. So our lack of responding like Germany cost the lives of uh, 130, 140,000 Americans. If we had done as good as Japan, we'd have saved 170,000 Americans and unfortunately our numbers are going up dramatically so we're probably going to eclipse a lot of these countries in the next month because of the outbreaks to the south uh, and we're doing comparable to more to less developed countries like Brazil unfortunately and Mexico we should be doing better than that uh, United Kingdom uh, so let's talk a little bit about herd immunity United Kingdom initially the, their politicians, Boris Johnson and his ex, and his health director, thought they would go for to herd humanity. Uh, then they actually ran the numbers and realized, oh no, that is a horrible idea. So they finally got things under control a little too late, but they did get things under control because they realized how bad a job herd humanity was, partly because, because Boris Johnson himself was sick and in the hospital. Uh, we did not run those numbers, and we and, uh, hear people talk about going for herd. Those are people who have not looked at the numbers themselves. So let's look at what herd humanity math 
actually means. And so uh, what is herd humidity? Well, there's a little bit of debate. Most experts think it's 60 to 70 percent of the population needs to get infected before you reach herd humidity. There are a few people out there that are looking at differential spread within the community who think it could be as low as 40 to 50 percent. So I'll run numbers here on both 40 percent and 70 percent. Uh, we do know that we probably are not counting all the people who are infected because of our lack of testing as well. So if we take a conservative estimate and say that, well, for every case there's four more that go undiagnosed, uh, will, will you run another scenario thinking that we actually have five times the, the number of people infected than we think so far? So this would give us a range of, uh, of estimates that are, are you know, the, mo the rosiest versus the most conservative. Well, if we wanted to get to herd humidity in three months, which is some, what some uh, people like, I think, Senator Urban think we need to do, uh, that would mean we'd have to have anywhere from seven to almost 15,000 people getting infected every single day. We'd have to keep it up for three solid months. Uh, it'd be hard to have a steady state of people getting infected like this. The only way to do that effectively would actually have both intermittent lockdowns when our numbers got too high and intentionally infecting people when our numbers got too low neither of which I think the, the state could pull off, and I don't think people would agree with anyway, but literally that's what it would take to get to herd humidity in three months. The next problem, though, you run into is if that many people get sick per day, about 5% of those will end up in the hospital. Well, how many people would be in the hospital, uh, assuming they're on an average of, uh, hospital average of 10 days? Anywhere from 3,400 to over 7,000 people would be in the hospital every day. That actually exceeds our, hospital, our total hospital capacity. You're just a little under here in the rosiest scenario possible. But what they, what you don't realize is those 3,800 beds, a lot of them are already full. And there are already people there who have had heart attacks, strokes, colon cancer operations. We can't just not treat everybody else. So in even the most rosy scenario, we would far exceed our bed capacity. And the problem with that is that means that her mortality rate goes up dramatically. So the, the coronavirus is probably just as bad as the influenza epidemic in 1917-18 from a mortality perspective. The reason the mortality rate's lower is because we have modern medical care. We have ICUs and IV fluids and oxygen tanks and ventilators that they didn't have 100 years ago. So this 0.65%, which is the average projection right now for the mortality rate, that would be far exceeded uh, if we exceeded our bed capacity and we'd actually be in, more, uh, in mortality rates in the one to three percent uh, once we uh, got out of our exceeded our hospital capacity. So even the most conservative ther ther scenarios, getting to herd humidity by November would be 15 to 40,000 dead Nebraskans. So you, if you believe anybody about herd humidity, have them walk through this math. And this isn't a simple Excel spreadsheet. This isn't rocket science. So herd humidity is just generally a bad idea. Uh, and then there's some more, and if you want to do some more reading, I've, I've linked to this article from the Royal Society of Medicine talking about Sweden's prized humidity, which isn't panning out either. Uh, Sweden, of course, they tried to go herd humidity. That didn't, they, their mortality rates got really high. Uh, their mortality rate overall is actually higher than ours yet, although we'll exceed them pretty quickly because Sweden did get things under control. They were able to get most Swedes to actually follow directions to wear a mask, which is our problem. We have not getting everybody to wear masks, short of a, a mask mandate. Uh, so herd immunity. Everybody wants herd immunity. They just don't want to be part of it. That's the real problem. And nobody wants to be part of that herd. Um, the other thing is Ali Khan is, uh, if you notice in our Tableau site, the, if we use the UNMC threshold, he asked us to add another color, sky blue, for essentially sky blue, sky is the limit on how many people you want to kill. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, just trying to get attention to people, realize that, you know, places like Douglas County are nowhere under control. Now we'll see if their mass mandate gets them to where they need to be. The other thing is this 10 per 100,000 threshold. That's what some of the uh, other states that are doing a good job are using as their threshold for uh, travel bans or 14 day quarantines or no play zones for sports. Uh, so there, so one of the elephants in the room in the Nebraska and NSAA right now is do Lincoln teams really want to play Omaha teams if their numbers are, are, are way out of control like this? I don't know if I want our players going to Omaha to play, and I don't know if I want them to come to us. The same thing goes for North Platte, Kearney, Grand Island. Does Grand Island really want to play Kearney or North Platte if their numbers are under control? So the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about is, do we really want people traveling across Nebraska? So... Our work weakest links in the coming weeks, uh, my biggest worry is all the outside activities. Uh, so for example, the Papio La Vista High cheerleader, uh, they think that there may have been a mass exposure because of the dinner afterwards. Uh, Lincoln Southwest, we had a team, freshman uh, who got infected. They had to quarantine the whole freshman team. Uh, so we're seeing uh, that these outside activities are, are probably our downfall if we're not careful. Uh, yes, it's probably safe to run outside, but the kids, if they're gonna huddle together afterwards, they need to stop that. You know, baseball was safe playing baseball, but all those kids sitting in the dugout with no mask or carpooling or going to the team dinner, that's where it's getting spread. 
the other issue we're running into is the colleges are coming back and so college after college across the country is having to close down because of off-campus parties essentially so uh, here in Lincoln the UNL students just came back uh, that's my biggest worry now there's the the one thing that could help us is can we keep that population contained if they stay in their fraternity and sorority houses and then their dorms and don't go home come home to do laundry at least hopefully it won't spread to the rest of the community but this is a big problem with the spread to the rest of the community uh, other problem is just people just not wearing a mask uh, properly. So uh, I'll probably at the next school board meeting, I'll start calling out the nose commandos here. Uh, yes, the nose is connected to your lungs and the mask has to go over your nose. So please get over it and wear a mask correctly. Uh, you had Dr. Burks coming to, to Nebraska, uh, basically because on their numbers, they can see that Nebraska may be the next outbreak state, uh, just like uh, Texas and Arizona and Florida and Georgia, if they don't get things under control. And basically, as she pointed out, Wearing a mask is not a partisan issue. This is just plain science. There's no Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal thing. Masks work. There is no debate in the healthcare community about this. Um, and like I said, you know, Omaha got its mask ordinance a little over a week ago. It'll take about two weeks to see how effective that is. Uh, and then lastly, I've become a big convert. You know, so there's two things that, that will get us out of this. One is getting everybody to wear a mask, uh, at least more than 80% of people minimum. Uh, the second is rapid testing. And so I've become a complete M Michael Mina convert. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, the Atlantic article that came out a few days ago. I'd highly encourage you to read it, and I've got a link in the notes section if you want to take a look at it. Um, essentially, you know, test turnaround is one of our biggest things, and with the PCR test, we don't have enough turnaround. Uh, the good news is that actually Lancaster County is now putting la average turnaround time on its uh, website. So you can go look at uh, Lancaster County, and hopefully the rest of the state will start doing the same as well. Uh, if you look, you can actually figure out where you want to go. So uh, for turnaround time, uh, P-Lab stands for Physician's Lab. That's what, what a lot of the independent primary care clinics you'll use. So you might want to call your primary care doctor because they got the fastest turnaround time right now. Uh, Quest, uh, I'm not sure who uses Quest and Lincoln on, to be honest with you. Test Nebraska is, is, both, is also CHI. Uh, LabCorp is the one used by Brian. So hopefully we'll get this test turnaround, but because three days is just not adequate. We need to be one to two days. And that's one of the reasons Michael Mean is pushing on this is that we need better turnaround uh, because, you know, essentially you need to have, you need to diagnose here, not here. And last week I had a family member who got tested or not a family friend who got tested. Uh, unfortunately, they did, she didn't get the result until eight days later. So had she been infected, it was negative. So she wasn't, we wouldn't, she wouldn't, might not have been properly quarantined. So we need testing right away. What Michael Mean is saying, these PCR tests that are exquisitely sensitive and basically the perfect test. Well, sometimes we're letting perfect be the enemy of the good. What we need is a cheap antigen test because it doesn't really matter that much if we miss these tests because these people aren't infectious anymore and you might quarantine them unnecessarily. What you really want to do is catch them now. And so maybe I could, the PCR will catch you a little early, but if it takes you eight days to get the test result back, it doesn't help you. These cheap antigen tests, we could do them every day. And so, yeah, maybe I miss it this day, but I do another test tomorrow and now I've caught it. Uh, this would be a game changer for us. Uh, essentially, you could open up international travel. You could probably be if, if they're cheap enough and fast enough, you could literally even open up bars. The bouncer could be sitting out there with a stack of these papers. You spit on the paper and it turns positive. You can't come in. If it's negative, hey, you can come in the bar. Uh, and so this really would be a game changer. So uh, so I would highly encourage you to read up about, about, about this approach and, and maybe even contact your congressman because we need federal backing for this to happen because part of the, what's slowing this down is, is federal regulations that don't quite understand this. And frankly, we're just not funding. We're funding just about everything else. So hopefully this is helpful to you all. Uh, again, the, the links are at the bottom and disclaimer that uh, this is my opinion, not necessarily everybody else, but this is the places I, I work for or work with so you know kind of who I am. Uh, and hopefully this is helpful to you.